accept that. Welcome to this poetry reading series on Zoom presented by the Centre des Arts de Stansted. My name is Shelley Pomerantz. Je vous souhaite le bienvenu à cette lecture de poésie sur Zoom, présenté par le Centre des Arts de Stansted. This poetry reading comes to you from Stansted in the Eastern Townships, the traditional and unceded territory of the Abenaki people and the Wabanaki Confederacy. We're grateful to be part of a long and proud history of creating and sharing stories on these lands. As you may already know, we alternate events. We have poets read in French and poets read in English. And once in a while, we mix it up and we have a bilingual event. Today's event is in English and features the poets Stephanie Bolster and Ihab Lotayev. Uh, before we begin, I'll just give you a few details. During the reading, I'm going to invite you to close your mic and your camera. Um, uh, but at the end of the reading, we'll I'll invite everybody to open their camera and mic up and we can have a little chat. During the event, if you have a comment on a poem or if you have a question for the poets, please put your question or comment in the chat section. And at the, uh, during the Q&A period, I'll uh, ask your questions to the poets along with some questions of my own. Um, and now to introduce the poets. Stephanie Bolster has published four books of poetry, the most recent of which, A Page from the Wonders of Life on Earth, was a finalist for the Pat Lowther Award. Work from her current manuscript, Long Exposure, was a finalist for the CBC Poetry Prize in 2012 and 2019. Her first book, White Stone, the Alice Poems, won the Governor General's Award and the Gerald Lampert Award in 1998 and was translated into French and published by Pierre Blanche, oh, it's called Pierre Blanche, it published as Pierre Blanche, excuse me. Uh, Stephanie was editor of the Best Canadian Poetry in English 2008. She was born in Vancouver and she teaches creative writing at Concordia University here in Montreal. Ihab Lotayev is a Canadian IT manager, poet, writer, and community activist of Egyptian origin. He has published a bilingual poetry collection to Love a Palestinian Woman, published by Tsar, Tsar in uh, 2010, and his play Crossing Gibraltar was produced by the CBC in 2006. His work also appears in many anthologies and zines, and over the years he has written op-eds on various subjects for a number of Canadian papers. Ihab is deeply involved in social and community work, including campaigns against the sanctions and the war in Iraq, opposing the blockade of Gaza, organizing and being on board the Freedom Flotilla, and advocating for indigenous rights. He holds a degree in electrical engineering from Ain Shams University in Cairo. He moved to Canada in 1989. He's a father of two and has three grandchildren. Stephanie and Ihab are going to take turns alternating reading. Uh, first, we'll hear from Stephanie and then Ihab and, and back and forth like that. So Stephanie, um, I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Shelley, for, for that introduction. And thank you to, to Sharda for technical support, um, getting things started um, uh, beforehand this afternoon. And thank you so much to uh, Gabriel Safdie for the invitation. Um, it's really a pleasure to participate in this, in this reading series. And I have a fondness for Stansted, so I wish, I wish we were there physically, but I'm glad that uh, doing this uh, reading virtually enables all of us to be here. So thank you everybody for being here, wherever here is. Um, I'm going to read uh, for my, my first installment, I'm going to read um, from the Long Exposure Project, which I've been working on for um, about a decade now. And um, the poems um, take a number of subjects, but my starting point when I, when I began this project um, was to draw inspiration from photographs taken by Robert Polidori, uh, who's a photographer, was born in Montreal, um, has lived in, worked in the US for decades now. Um, he's best known for going to various uh, post-disaster sites and uh, documenting um, the scenes of devastation there. So I was particularly drawn to his photographs of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and the levee breaches. Um, and also his photographs of Chernobyl. So I'm going to be reading um, uh, two sec sections from the New Orleans part and one section from the Chernobyl part. 
Um, there is a bit of found material in here. I won't be citing all of my sources, but I think you'll be able to tell probably from the tone that that some of the material is uh, is from from other other voices, um, and that part appears in italics in the text. Um, so this is from Long Exposure, and this section is called New Orleans Room, two thousand five to two thousand six. He didn't move the dress. Polidori moved himself to make the dress the center of regret. He saw it, so we see. The world in the form of a storm sent them out of the room, ran for their lives, with their lives, lost or left their lives to fill with water and wind or peel from the walls. What they think of the room, if they think of it, if they have lived to think of it, doesn't look like this, ordinary voices, TV, coffee. The passport, the jammed bags, the cab ride, the check-in, the bag tag, the wait, the gate, the seat, the takeoff, ice or no ice, the napkin, the bing, the buckle released, the icon for baggage, the bag more battered, the wait, the cab, the ride, the name and the pin, the card in the door, the room with a bed, the light and the sink, the rest, the drive to the room. The room no one's in, but the one who's come all this way to be in the room. He went inside and with no power, he kept the shutter open long enough for the light there was to seal the scene of what there was. Until he presses, nothing happens. When he presses, the nothing affixes. Prints are made of it. Walk into rooms of walls, look into the rooms on the walls. The larger the negative, the more. In the print of the wreck of a room, smaller than the room, larger than the mind, are things we wouldn't have seen had we been there. Some of us were. Is there ever us? The opening, stemless glasses, chatter. This red, how did he get this red? Or this mold is Baroque. Not real art because he just looked, because someone asked for it, because a magazine, because someone paid for it. He didn't move anything, didn't make anything. Many saw it because there was an opening, because he didn't live there. It really happened. It wasn't supposed to happen, keeps happening. The room breathing in, breathing out. It is happening again. Back on his own dime, he opens the door of a house soft with water, the smell of what it carried rampant, a mirror seeped of its reflection dead dog, a dead fridge. He vomits again, opens the shutter and waits. A kitchen scale wavers. In the room he slept in, the mattress stripped bears its old stains. In the bar fridge, an orange drying. Set out beside the sink, a razor, a canister of pent up froth. Next door, another door. As though rooms knew what would become of them, as though they were skins or had skins or eyes or felt anything and a dog wandered through and howled and the walls responded and I was the dog, the thing that trespassed. Would the one who lived there recognize it on a wall? Before it was a scene, it was a self. So that was the, the first section. The second section from not Long Exposure is called New Orleans Address. 2005 and onward. The red dress, a crescendo off center, a Southern comfort poster, a cloud of feathers on a wheelchair. Someone hung a mirror, someone bought a shoe tree. Someone didn't go to the French quarter unless visitors, not often. Someone suspended a trio of baskets from the ceiling. Nearly half over 74. After two days, no dead counted as Katrina victims. Barking on roofs, the hospitality of pineapple bedposts darkened. In the rooms, frames with nothing left, or the intention of rooms, planks held by nails and spaces, all our houses are. This page may be too long to read and navigate comfortably. Please consider splitting content into sub-articles, condensing it, or adding or removing subheadings. For the one who left, this bed is a dead link. What's left is not what was, minus what's gone. 
fled to a wind whipped stadium, a suit inside a shelter, higher ground where the jobs are, space just big enough to rest a flame of ash, a coffee can. This was once someone's, a jacket, a chair back, a plum winced into. Google Polidori images, the screen fills. Two matching frames, convoluted corners, a chandelier, the bulbs lifted like wicks, a sandal, a car mat, the debris black. The caption is an address. Around the corner, someone might live or might again, a banishment, another place, another kind of time. A girl home from school slams the door, angry in a minor way the future won't permit her. No one notices the wallpaper, the 70s flock, thick as mildew, foreshadowing. Only after is this called before. Google Maps, enter the address, click on the little orange man, drag me to the map. Lift, it feels like lifting, all in the wrist. Set him down there. A field and a bridge, the letter A in a red bulb in the field, then black. Wait a bit, the image changes. A sidewalk a driveway in hot grass, where a house was a patch barren of grass, a shadow of a tree across the barren patch. Sometimes of year, there might be chicory. And I will now read um, from the, uh, the Chernobyl material. The, the title I use for that is Shelter Object, um, which is a translation of um, the term used for the sarcophagus that was built over top of the, um, the reactor to protect it, um, which was then later replaced uh, with the new safe confinement, which was a you know, newer and better, more durable um, protector, but still always temporary. So this is a shelter object, Chernobyl fire, 1986. The constellations made of fear, chaos where a shape was, stars where a roof, a fire where a place, the world asleep in its bed, world irrevocable, the heat unfathomable. They worked shirtless, already acute in hospital. Soon coffins of zinc, soon they gut the wards of the dead. Tried robots, but robot death seized their limbs if they were limbs. So bio robots, men scraped into a flat shovel, some graphite rods and dust tossed from the roof, count the seconds each man done onto the next and the next of thousands, of hundreds of thousands. Liquidators past the limit got more rubles, the currency of vodka. The drunker, the longer the stay, the more rubles. Their most important work. Decades later, after a stroke, one got enough for 700 grams of butter. Too late, they did not shout on May Day. 14 days it took to die, his tongue came out. Leaves just opening. The parade stands empty, the children of officials already sent away. Flash of paparazzi where radiation ate the film. Years it took to die. His organs in his mouth she wiped out. They'd wanted to be safe. They'd wanted the test done so they'd know. If an enemy struck, would the reactor survive? Disaster as likely as lightning. Men fished from a bridge. Loved a fire, all colors flashing, old colors, new colors. Tourists come, the fishermen long gone, the bridge of death, they say, it's in a game online. The leaves just coming out, the forest thinly green, that first gold, then red. The poison climbed in and poured its soft sound out, the face of a monster, she wouldn't show a mirror. Some looked into the explosion, some said it changed the color of a man's eyes. She cut her nails to the quick, the sheets tore him where they touched. In labor at the graveside, the baby dead in hours, she hadn't told them at the hospital. Her beloved, a reactor, eye of the beholder, the body shitting itself out 30 times a day, worse to suffer or to watch, worse to tell the woman with the, react with the recorder. Why are you coming here, some said, what do you want? The bad meat in the expensive salami fewer would buy. Worse meat, frozen in freight cars, turned away each stop. 600 tons, four years the same meat, until they dug and buried where it came from, never as deep as the constellations are high. The mine rusts or rots. What it held falls through, silence divided by silence. To be sorted, to be remade, to be left and leech into what birth? To last. 
Her words before transcription, before translation were their words, before they were words. Still the cows spurted milk, they shot the dogs. No hat, head back in the grass. What you don't know won't, what you don't imagine. How long it takes for safe is a mind fuck. Plutonium 720,000 years. They used to hold hands even asleep, lucky to live by the stained glass cafe by the pool. You can go, you can look for a price, before viral, before forever. He said, I was close to something then. I haven't had that feeling again, even in love. I will read it again, how she cleaned his mouth with her hand. I will wash my hands. Thank you. Now over to Ihab. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I don't know if Shelley will jump in to say something or should I just go? You can just go. Okay. It's your show now. <laughs> thank you. So um, thank you everybody for, for being here and surely thank you for the invitation. And I echo what, uh, what Stephanie said. I would have loved this to be uh, live in person uh, uh, to go to Stansted for, for, a, for a day or half a day. But here we are, we have been doing with what we have for the last uh, close to two years now and we'll continue till life gets back to normal. Um, two things I'll say before I start reading, uh, I will share the poems uh, on screen while I'm reading. Uh, I think that could be very uh, helpful for uh, listeners to connect to what I'm saying. And uh, the second thing is that that is something that I did not try before. So uh, it might be a bit glitchy technically. So let's hope it works smoothly. So here I am starting to do this and share. Um, so I guess it is on your screen. I know it won't be very useful if people are using small devices, uh, like on the phone or something, but uh, for those on their computers, I think it will be, um, it will be easy to follow. And um, something went wrong, okay. We, we can see it, I can see it, Ehab, here. Uh, it says your sharing has paused, so I don't know. Is well, that it's still up on my screen. So far, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so I don't know what it means by paused, but okay. Um, okay, I'll stop sharing and start again, just to make sure. And here we go. So the first poem I'm gonna read is uh, the latest poem I have written. And um, uh, it was just a few days ago that I shared this poem with a small uh, poetry list that, uh, that I have, that I share my poetry on. And um, many people thought this was a story about or referring to the incidents we've heard about refugees uh, crossing the, um, the English Channel and drowning from between France and England, or what's been happening on the border uh, between uh, Belarus and Poland. Uh, but really, uh, this is a very personal uh, poem, uh, a very personal uh, experience that I went through. Um, I have met a very short, relatively very short while ago, a refugee who came to Canada with his young family. And um, I felt that he has great potential and he's a really solid, ambitious and intelligent person. Um, last weekend, uh, he unfortunately um, had a stroke induced by uh, side effects of COVID and uh, he was in intensive care and he passed away a couple of days ago. Um, and this poem is really about 
him, but of course it is not only about him because this journey uh, of being a refugee is shared by, in today's world, I won't say by hundreds of thousands, by, by millions and millions of, of, of people. And uh, some are luckier than others, but I guess it scars you for life no matter where you end up or how you end up. So, beyond the finish line, you travel far to fight a fight that you have never sought. You show the gods that you're at peace with the bad hand they dealt. You hug your boy, you kiss your wife, you put your girl to sleep. Now you're alone, you and the night and all those ruthless beasts. You're standing tall, you won't give up, but night always deceives. You beat the odds, can't be denied, but they won't let you be. The goal was near, so very close, yet so far out of reach. It had to end. No one can run beyond the finish line. So that was my first poem. I will share the screen for my second poem, which is um, which is a poem about the injustice we see in our societies um, towards anybody who is different. And uh, this poem is a reflection on something we have seen start in Europe many years ago, and we have seen it come to uh, Quebec uh, last year or two years ago with the introduction of, although the talk about it was there for so many years, but it was legalized two years ago with the passing of Law 21 in Quebec that denies people wearing religious symbols the right to, a, to employment in certain government positions. And it does affect many communities, many faiths, but mostly um, those who look into it deeply know that the main target is uh, the woman's veil in particular. So here's a poem that starts sarcastically about that and let's see where it goes. My hair is flying free, liberated from the veil, a freedom that's imposed on me, a jail. A freedom without choice, a slimy web, in which if trapped, although unveiled, we die. The liberties on which this land was built now suffocate a bird longing to fly. To paint the cage grass green won't make a field. The bars, though colored blue, are not the sky. The prison walls are rising once again. A shameless night is drowning all the stars. Whip me on the steps at Place des Arts. Crucify me on the cross of Mont Royal. I will um, move next to a, a poem that uh, I wrote during the pandemic, and it is, I guess, self-explanatory of the struggles that many of us went through. Uh, and sorry, I keep looking left and right because I'm moving windows from one screen to another. 
This poem is called One Way Ticket. One Way Ticket. There were birds in the sky. There was fish in the sea. People roaming the streets and greening the fields. At the dawn of despair, they all disappear. A one-way ticket to nowhere. Babies would cry, mothers would weep. What's home and what's peace? If no one believes, it's a one-way ticket to nowhere. Flowers wither and die and hope fades away. A lot has gone by but there's nothing to say. It's a one-way ticket to nowhere. And uh, the last poem I'm gonna share with you in this segment um, is a, a poem that I wrote um, I wrote inspired by a poem I wrote in Arabic. I really don't like translating my poems uh, that I write in one language to the other. I do sometimes just for the benefit of the, of the reader or the listener who doesn't speak the language. So this is really not a translation. It is very close to a poem, a poem I wrote in Arabic, but it is not a translation. Uh, so... Here it is. The trip. At the end, promises will be broken. The earth will reject its children. The heavens will weep. Guilty, I hide my smile, which conceals my sorrow from the poor and the vulnerable. A lover who never met me misses me. Two strangers we remain. In distant worlds we were born. In distant worlds we shall die. I return to my point of origin, a bleeding soul in a shattered body. Naive despite the wounds I meet each new day with heartfelt hope. With our nails, we scratch the wall to open a crack that may allow the light to reach our inner darkness. For what are we if we cease to chase our fantasies and demand the impossible? And what will remain of us if we bury the dreams of our youth in the wilderness of adulthood? Thank you. Thank you so much for that reading, Ihab. It's uh, yeah, very, very moving. Um, I'm going to, I want to just sit and reflect on your poems, but I will <laughs> leap back in and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> read some more poems. Um, this time I'm going to be reading from um, a page from the, from the Wonders of Life on Earth, which although it's my most recent book, it, uh, it did come out a decade ago. Um, as I mentioned, I've spent a long time lurking, working on long exposure. So um, hopefully that will be, uh, you know, a book that one can hold in one's hands uh, in the not too distant future. But um, at this point, um, I, I think the two projects are very much linked in terms of um, looking. Um, the poems, obviously, that I that I read earlier from the Polidori photographs, I was very much interested in and um, unsettled by um, that gaze of looking into um, the whole, what was once someone's home, um, which has been destroyed and is uninhabitable, and Polidori was able to visit that space, um, to go in there, to, to take pictures, um, and I was then able to look at those pictures um, and write about it. Um, so that's that makes me uncomfortable, um, and that's that's why I wrote about it is is those questions of who gets to who gets to see what and who gets to speak. Um, so this this project, which predates it. Um, 
is similar in terms of its interest in looking. Um, I intended to write a book about animals. Um, and then I thought, well, uh, no, I'm going to write about zoos because I have very mixed feelings about, uh, about zoos. And I was interested in the, the history of zoological gardens, um, in particular, those from the, the 19th century and prior. Um, and in, in the end, I think it, it became really a, a series of poems that were about about voyeurism, about the sort of the flana kind of tourist mentality, about the the isolation and anonymity of being that that looker, um, the onlooker. Um, so the poems I'm going to read are are somewhat about that. Uh, some of them are about about gardens. Some of them are about zoos. Some of them are about museums. Um, all places where we do different different kinds of looking that are more or less complicated um, ethically and aesthetically. Um, so I, I won't talk too much about the poems, um, having prefaced them with, with these remarks, but I will say that um, there's a recurring title in this book, uh, Life of the Mind. So I have a number of poems called Life of the Mind with various different subtitles. Um, and those poems, if you see them on the page, they are sort of a series of you know, long lines with a lot of space between them. Um, so I'm going to start with the first poem in this book, um, which is kind of an overture um, to the, or sort of a preview um, of, of the book as a whole. Uh, so this is called Life of the Mind Wanders, and it's set in Paris. A wrecked edifice wavers in a puddle, shoes in gravel, the leather sucking water. There is beauty everywhere in this city, history everywhere, a pit that held a bear before the war. Most cut through on their way from the Gare d'Austerlitz to work. The crêpes have been stacked. Jars of Nutella fog the glass. Cropped limbs and statues, months before the chestnut trees let rise their rose plumes. Apollo could not take her, she was already other. Somewhere a turnstile, the great apes, the great cats. It is almost yesterday. Sometimes a little rain falls through a labyrinth in which it's difficult to lose oneself. Along the Seine in summer for a month, there is a beach. The uh, next poem also set in Paris is called Comfort. A Spanish man who rides the metro daily, open palm delivering a discourse on his poverty, puts his face to the chimpanzee's glass to be in there warm hay and tires, oranges, and look how the mother presses the young one close. If he took this city by the neck and shook, would the strand break, pearls roll into corners? Underneath the metro runs faces he could spend an hour watching if the earth were made of glass. Um, this is another life of the mind poem. Um, it includes a couple of found pieces, um, one from a, an REM lyric, the other one I can't exactly now remember, but a, a book on collecting. Um, and there's um, also a reference to a New Yorker article about uh, the cleaning of a, of a uh, antique, excuse me, an antique tapestry um, that was in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so this is life of the mind tapestry. One makes a way. It takes the shape of pears, of mammals with spines, of eggs containing mammals which lay eggs. Buds swell to nipples, clung to by rain. The true collector detaches the object from its functional relations. The world is present and indeed ordered in each of his objects. Matryoshka dolls rest inside themselves, unshelled. Plush with wet, the mat of astroturf darkens beyond lawn lives as the tapestry lived when unhung. This world is big and so awake. The tapestry photographed in squares, shifting as it settles, a puzzle undone. Rain stain on the pine. This is life, not your life. Laughter flickers in the bushes. Just try to arrange it. Um, picking up on that, this is another Another tapestry poem um, 
This is about one of the um, one of the unicorn tapestries, um, not one of the ones that's in in Paris, but what it's in the um, the Cloisters Museum, which is part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, way up at the northern tip of Manhattan. Tapestry, the Cloisters. The unicorn made of stitches by hands by the thousands of hours in Ghent or Bruges or possibly years. The unicorn held in a ring of pickets, his beard and buckled collar and blood where they caught him. All around the flowers with the names of Venetian glass, the hellebore and unbidden berries. All around a place they went to day and night, the candles straining the eyes. Skin softened by wool, the sheep in the field, the wolf. At this great distance, the horn is the pinnacle, as tall as the beast is rampant, its tip a single thread squinted over, an instant still flinching. And this is uh, another New York Museum poem. Um, it's called Frick Collection. Um, the Frick Collection, um, some of you may know, it's a fairly small museum um, um, off of Fifth Avenue, uh, and it, uh, it was once a private residence, um, and so um, there's a sense of, of opulence, luxury, a sense of gratitude that this is now a public space, and then, of course, the sense of who had the money to buy this art in the first place and donate it and where did that money come from, et cetera. That's not, that's not in the surface of the poem, but it's something that's in my mind as I, as I think about the poem. Um, and it's also a, a traveling poem. Frick Collection. Though there are three Vermeers and such painted plush as into which I would wish to sink my fingers and an audio guide hush as everyone circulates enclosed a stare, the conservatory is the thing. Its long tiled pool amidst leaf sheen and the dense resolute scent of forest blooms. Were I there now, I would still want to be there then, morning, hungry, lonely, tongue seared from coffee. If I had such foliage, such waterlit, skylit space in my house, days would still be days, always about the same degree of happy. Sometimes this consoles. After lunch, we, me and my brother, traveling alone together for the first time. We went back in and saw it all again, and it was just as good. And afterward, the light along Fifth Avenue sifted not just through leaves, it was fall, though the mind sets this in spring, but glass poised so high it had no need of us. Um, this one is called Home. The European harvest mouse, tailless, kept climbing the same blade of grass, a figure eight, an hourglass. Under the words, the most dangerous animal, a mirror. I'd seen that before. The orangutan was about to reach out. When I woke up, the cages clattered back under the bed. I washed my hair. And I will read just one more poem. Um, this one um, has two, two references. One is to an article um, in National Geographic, um, and in particular, a photograph of a, of a seabird um, that had died from having consumed um, too much trash. And um, the second reference is to Elizabeth Bishop's poem, The Fish. Uh, so this will be my last poem. This is Rainbow. A photograph fans out the bright contents of the six month plover's gut. The last hundred things it ate, dead lighters, crushed glass, cigarettes until no room. We do wrong and yet that reek of alley rot, puke, tunnel pent air, I love because New York, London, Paris. Five times the fish says yes to the hook, no to the tug. Five times keeps what's given and so the poet lets it go into wallpaper, similes, feathers, into the greasy rainbow. Can art cancel ruin? Who am I to gulp the world and live? So thank you very much and over to you, Eva. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, I'll do this again 
with the screen sharing. I hope this is not taking too much time and it's meaningful to. It's fine, no problem. So this is a poem uh, I wrote many years ago um, when a friend of mine was in a coma for a long time and I was reflecting on, on that. I titled it The Zone. She's lying there between the sinful and the pure, between the light and scorching heat, between this livid world and fate, between footprints we left on sand and the unknown that drives us mad, between the garden and this land, between the dreams we have all dreams and dreams of peace no human had, Will she be back to hold my hand? I am not sure what I should say. I am full of fear even to pray. When I'm not so sure for what to ask, so I sit still wearing a mask. I dare not stare, I dare not peek, I dare not murmur, whisper, speak, lest I may blunder in my words and she may hear. Maybe she's here, maybe so near, and I'm the one who wandered far. She's lying there, a smiling face like angels, clear. But since she's here and she's not here, who prays for who isn't that clear? Sometimes one reads something uh, and it has an effect on himself as me in this case that I did not expect. Poems bring back things that, uh, yeah. <sighs> okay, um, let me try to get out of this. Um, the next poem was written after the attack on the mosques in Christchurch. And um, no matter how ugly and how difficult and how painful that was and how shameful that was, it left me with one thing, which is the actions of the uh, New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, and gave me, gave me hope. So here is the poem, A Mosque in Christchurch. He strikes you on the cheek, you turn the other and say, strike again, go in peace. Let's build the world that will survive the bomb, that will survive the pain. No spillage harms a whale, no drilling kills the land, no acid rain. Let's build a world where we could talk all night and disagree, then together enjoy the nascent dawn. A world without the fear that begets hate, where no one lives in shame, where no one dies alone. Uh, the next poem is, the next poem is Deception, and uh, it is mostly a reflection on the years we have spent with Donald Trump, although it was written very, very early uh, after his, his election. So here we go. The Gospel of Deception. Hate scars juvenile minds. 
Hell is a desire no one survives. Days turn into nightmares. Shame begets fear. Young hearts burst into flame. A king abdicates. There is no heir. In a designer suit, in a scandalous pursuit, he sneaks by, disbelieving we deny. Real estate developers, oil tycoons, investment bankers are writing the gospel of the third millennium. A community garden turns into a mansion. A school is replaced by a casino. A playground becomes a condominium. An Air Force pilot, after bombing civilians, sips tea in Chelsea. An intelligence officer whose intelligence orphans children takes a stroll on the bank of the Seine. The sea swallows Amsterdam, snow engulfs Gamlestan. Escape when you can, escape if you can. And I'm going to end with a, a personal experience poem, a relationship poem that um, took so many years to, um, to, to finish. So here it is, footsteps. I trace my journey step by step, a path I walked alone. You grow on me, I grow on you, we sing a sacred tune. When darkness grows, you scar my heart, I wound your soul, we fall. The music fades and fear creeps in, the vibrant tune goes stale. As we descend the pit of guilt, Surrendering to fate, the road to love is blocked by doubt, the road to peace by hate. Thank you. Thank you, Ihab, and thank you, Stephanie, both of you. That was extraordinary. Um, and we have a, a, a time for some questions now. I have some questions for both of you. And if people have questions they want to put in the um, in the chat. Oh, we have a message here from Brendan McGowan, who says, thank you both for sharing. Loved hearing both of your works, both so moving and powerful. I have a question for Stephanie. You mentioned the first three poems that you read came from a photographer's work. Do you find that you pull inspiration from others often? I think it is quite beautiful when art grows and stems from other art. Could you talk about this process and your writing process a little bit? Thank you so much. Well, there you go. That was on my mind too. So go ahead, Stephanie. If you could okay, thank you. you. Thank you, Brendan, for that question. Um, I do write often from art. Um, tends to be more from visual art than from, from other forms, although I, I have um, you know written from literature as well. But I, I find that... Um, there are just so many motivations in doing it. In fact, I once uh, engaged in a, a long email conversation with two other writers who work the same way. And we you know, published this as an interview in a uh, ARC magazine did an ekphrasis issue, which is like ekphrasis is the, the term, as you may know, for, for writing from, from art. And it's um, some of the reasons I think are, um, it kind of narrows down the world. There's just, there's so much, so much uh, to work with. Um, and so having, I think seeing something that's been seen by someone else first or that's been made by somebody else first, there's a sense of um, engagement um, with another human being. I find that I, I certainly don't work actively uh, in collaboration as a writer. Um, in fact, I've, this is a bit of an aside, but I, I feel like it's kind of relevant. I, I started watching um, the, the Beatles documentary yesterday. Um, I just saw the first sort of part of it. And it was so interesting seeing a group of people work collaboratively making songs. And that process just fascinates me because for me, my process is so solitary. So I find that working with somebody else's work gives me a sense of connection to uh, you know, another, another creative mind, um, kind of gets me out of my own head. 
uh, gives me something to start with. And it's also, I think it's just how I, how I process, um, you know, the art or whatever it is that I'm looking at is, is to write about it. So I had actually resisted writing about Robert Polidori's photographs for quite a while because I had written about, you know, I'd written about zoos and that was sort of, you know, traumatic and, and troubling. And I thought maybe, you know, writing about something like this is not, it kind of felt like a predictable direction to go in. Um, but those photographer, you know, those, those images, they just wouldn't let go of me. Um, and, uh, I thought I just I have to write about the challenges of this um, and sort of bring all of the that bring that interrogation into the process of the writing. So um, maybe it is me, sorry to interrupt you, but maybe we can mention to people that those photos oh, yes. by Robert Polidari are in the chat. If you go to the top of the chat, Stephanie has put a whole bunch of photographs from Katrina and from Chernobyl in there. So you could have a look, click on those if you're if you're interested. Sorry exactly. That's no, it's it's exactly what I should have said. I I I I put them on there and I forgot they were there. But it's yeah, exactly. I think that that they're such complex photographs, and my response to them was so complex that I didn't feel I could leave it unworded. I I had to uh, I had to write about them. Um, so thank another, you, thank you for that question. Another technical in. I don't think people who join the chat after something is placed can see the previous history in the chat. So most of the audience, I don't think will be able to see the photos. You'll have to put them again. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Spok spoken like a true uh, <laughs> IT person, I would have had no idea of that. Um, I'm, I'm I can sure. maybe somebody could can somebody open their mic and tell us whether they can see. Well, somebody has there. already. Patrick Coleman has told us in the chat that he can't see them. Can't see them. So okay, maybe. I'll, so our maybe our well. What I can do is I can, if you want to put some in there, Stephanie, I can ask Ehab a few questions while you do sure. that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will do that. And I will come back. Thank you. you. Don't worry. Sorry for being the pain. <laughs> no, no, it's no. Great to have you here, Ehab? You know all this stuff. So um, much appreciated. Ehab, so I'll ask you a few questions now while we give Stephanie a chance to do that. Um, have you always written poetry in English? I mean, at what point did you start writing poetry in English? Oh, your mic is closed. I hate to be the one to tell you what I, I, <laughs> well, I, I came to Canada in 89, I was 30 years old and I had been writing poetry in Arabic, uh, mostly in, in colloquial Egyptian at that, uh, at that point of my life. And, um, uh, I, I spent a few years um, not being able to, to write because uh, uh, poetry for me is a, is a re reaction. It's, it's a very natural reaction, really. I don't, I don't try, I, I sell them, of course. I, I did it, but rarely did I try to write about something in particular. Mostly, I, just the, the idea or the, 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 the words come to me in whatever language they come. So... After a few years in Canada, I stopped being, I stopped not being able, but it stopped coming in Arabic. And at the same time, I was hesitant and afraid and concerned about the ability to write in English, although my, my, my language was okay, but um, it wasn't, it wasn't easy to, to do that. So it took, it took about uh, six, seven years before I started uh, writing more than a couple of lines in English. And um, uh, it was surely a decade before I started sharing my English writing with uh, with, with other uh, with other people. So uh, glad uh, you do. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so do you still do you still write in Arabic? Is it classical or colloquial? I I actually uh, still write in in Arabic in both colloquial and now I have. I, I improved my classical Arabic, which is a, a long story about many, many of us uh, from the Arab world who feel that classical Arabic is not really our first language, and it's not. Uh, so, uh, but because of the, the depth and the richness of the classical Arabic, during my years in Canada, I continued to study uh, Arabic uh, language and Arabic grammar uh, till I was comfortable enough to uh, to write in classical Arabic. My writings in classical Arabic from my, my teenage years and my, my university years were so much full of grammatical mistakes that it wasn't funny. And everybody everybody is in the same boat, except those who put a lot of effort in it. So, But yes, I do now write in, I would say in the three languages, in English, 
a classical Arabic and colloquial Egyptian. Hmm. Fascinating. Can you give us a sample? Can you read to us in, in Arabic? Uh, I I will I I I could I will read uh, a short poem uh, that is in colloquial Egyptian actually because um, it will give more of the musicality sense of uh, of of this uh, kind of uh, of poems. So um, it is a um, it's it's a short poem that could be also a, a song, uh, and it's called Lwahda, which means alone. Um, لو الدنيا داءت وجار الزمان ومات الضياء واستبد الظلام وهانوا الكرام وسادوا اللقام وتهنا ما بين الحلال والحرام لو ناسك خنوعة وصاحبك جبان يحب المراوغة يخاف من الكلام في وسط المظالم وتحت الحصار يا واقف لوحدك مفيش لك خيار بغير صوتك تنور ليالي الأسية بكلمة جريئة تناجي النهار so Thank this you. is this is a typical um, a typical colloquial Egyptian uh, Arabic poem. Um, of course, some of them go very long, but this is in a song poem form that is quite uh, quite traditional. Um, so of the poems that you read to us in English, um, they they have a, a a strong political element to them. Or at least I see them that way. Do you, do you think of your poetry as a form of activism? I, I do think of my poem, my poems as a reflection to my social and political involvement. Uh, I surely uh, don't write them as a uh, as anything other than poetry. They they are a reflection of of my thoughts, of my feelings. Uh, but I don't I don't write them. Uh, again, maybe there is an exception here or there, but I don't try them as, as political manifestos or as, as an expression of a message that I want to get through uh, politically, but they carry those messages for sure. And in both uh, Arabic and English, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, you're back. Uh, did you manage to put things in the chat? I haven't checked. They're, they're there, I believe, I tried one of them and it, it worked. So uh, there are, are a lot and people may, um, I guess what, well, once this is over, the chat's gone, but um, if people are interested, just you know, click on them and, and it'll give you a sense of uh, Polidori's work. Um, and you know, obviously he can be Googled uh, very easily as well uh, to find those series, but they're, it's, it's, it does them a disservice to see them on the screen because they're really, they're very large format photographs really really huge um and that that is part of their um impression i mean they almost feel like they're larger than the spaces that they that they document but of course they're they're not but the degree of detail is almost overwhelming i i went and read online uh, about some of these photographs and the ones of chernobyl he went there like 15 years after after the the meltdown of the reactor, but I was wondering about the ones from Katrina. Did he go soon after Katrina, or was it years after? Do you know? He went. He went a few times, but his first time was very soon after. Um, he was staying in. He was working for the the New York Times, um, so he was sent there. Um, and then later on, when he kept going back, it was of his own accord. Um, but so he was staying with the press in, you know, one of the few um, hotels that was still open in the French Quarter. And he was going into neighborhoods where he wasn't supposed to be going. Um, you know, the crews were in there and they were they were spray painting the outsides of the houses with it was a very particular um, kind of code of, you know, whether whether bodies had been found in the house, um, various you know, things to indicate the state of the premises um, and also just to indicate whether somebody had been there yet to inspect um, that property. Um, but there was often you know, the yellow, like do not cross tape or you know, it was implicit in any case, he, he wasn't supposed to be going into these houses, um, but he, he went in, he didn't have you know, tech people with him. He didn't have light. I mean, there was no electricity. So he was just going in there with his tools and, and that's partly where long exposure comes from is just, um, you know, the amount of light that he could get in these interiors, it's, you know, it was very long um, exposure to take these pictures, you know, he couldn't use flash, he didn't, uh, and he said that he didn't move anything, that he didn't touch anything, it was all just exactly how it was. Um, but um, 
Yeah, it's it's complicated because for me, when I think about the fact that this, you know, this was someone's life, um, they had to leave this space uh, under extremely traumatic conditions. Uh, in some cases, never went back. You know, were ended up at the airport and were sent off to who knows where, um, and didn't didn't come back to that space. Um, some people did try and come back and salvage things, but it was mostly unsalvageable. So, the fact that I have the opportunity to look at this photograph and see, you know, their video collection. Um, you know, it's, it's very unsettling, but his, his intentions, I mean, his expressed intentions, um, and I think, I think he's being honest in this, it was really to document the degree of damage, the degree of suffering and seeing something on the news, you know, seeing a camera pan down a bunch of, of houses and well, I mean, we're all thinking of this right now, you know, with flooding in BC, I mean, it's, it's devastating to see it, but I think there's something about seeing the interior to see that life that was built, these belongings that people chose um, to represent themselves. And, you know, he, he speaks a lot about the notion of the, the house as a representation of the self. And so it does, it feels very intimate to look at these, these images um, in ways that are, are really troubling and, uh, and also really beautiful and strange. And so, uh, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, you know, I, that's what I think people will, will feel when they see, see the photographs. I see that some people are not able to actually um, click and see see the images. Um, but you can so, go online. It's not hard to find them online. That's yeah, if you just if you just type in um, that particular the, the New Orleans project was called after the flood. So if you type in Robert Polidori after the flood, uh, which I'll just type here for you, um, or I'll type it for you in a minute. Um, and um, you know his Chernobyl photographs as well. It's very very easy to find his images. Uh, you know multiple yeah. multiple For sources people online. Who aren't who have tried? If you double click on them, they, they may open, it may be easier. Um, I, Stephanie and Eha, Ehab, um, uh, both at least the. It's very interesting to hear you read together. Um, um, and not not all of your poems, but many of them are are quite dark. Um, certainly, the the, the Polidori poems and Ehab's your most of the poems you read. Do you ever write lighter, less dark work? Should I go first? Um, okay. Not not really, <laughs> not really. <laughs> um, my my mother in law at times has said, you know, oh why. You know, or I think she probably didn't say this directly to me, but, you know, said to my husband, oh, why is she working on another depressing poetry project? You know, it, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's not by choice, but these are the things I feel compelled to write about. Um, and when I, you know, I'm thinking of like listening to music, you know, I'll often be drawn to like the, the you know, and I, I hate that term dark. I, I think I need there's better, better language for this. But, you know, the more troubling songs to me, those seem to be the ones that go deeper. Um, I feel that with with poetry, too. But I, I also um I really admire right. deep, is, deep is a better word than dark <laughs> but it but they're not they're not equivalent you know I mean what I would what I value well a poem like Hopkins poem the wind hover that's a deep poem that is not dark it's you know it's a poem of joy and I think it's very hard to write joyful poems um I think for me when I'm when um I don't know if I'm if I'm experiencing joy I'm experiencing it I'm not thinking about writing it um, so it's more, it's more the, the, the questions, the unsettling, uh, impacts the things that stay with me. Those are the things that are, that are difficult. And I think I tend to like to force myself to look at things that are difficult to look at and think about why that is, why do I feel compelled to think about these things? And so it's, um, yeah. And that, that tends to be the kind of work that I prefer reading as well. I'll, I'll, you know, back when there were video stores, I'd be the one who'd be sent off and be like, you know, the one that says this disturbing tale and I would take that one, so. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Ihab? Um, I, I, I would echo a lot of what, uh, what Stephanie said. Um, it would be the exception to have a more uh, a lighter poem. And uh, uh, the, way, the way Stephanie expressed it is that, I guess when, when you're happy, you, you, you don't, it doesn't touch you inside as much. I don't know how to put it really, but um, it's something like the light and and, and the dark. Uh, I think the 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 is the light the absence of darkness, or is darkness the absence of light? And is is, is sadness and, and 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 joy 
uh, are like that. But in any case, it's it's when when one is in the dark that uh, that one sinks deeper into into oneself. So it would be the, the, I have some lighter poems, but again, within my repertoire of of hundreds, uh, it, it's surely in the single digits. Okay. Um, just for people, because I noticed there are a number of messages saying that some people can't see the images. So it's, somebody asked for a link, but it's quite easy to find if you just write Robert Polidori, P-O-L-I-D-O-R-I, -I, his photographs will come up, many, many of them, especially if you click on images on the top of your screen. Um, one more thing before we let everybody go or before we uh, open up uh, cameras and mics, you know each other, the two of you, and I'm, I'm curious about how you know each other. Shall I start? Sure. Okay. Um, I believe it was it was at the time when I was starting to 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 get the courage to write poetry in English, and I remember maybe that's the first time I saw. Stephanie's something about Stephanie. Uh, I, she was on the cover of the Montreal Review of Books. And uh, then I met her, I think in the Yellow Door reading, but I asked her because as, as, a, as a professional uh, literary uh, person, I asked her if we can have a coffee and I can talk to her a bit about my poetry and my writing in English. And she graciously uh, accepted and we had a coffee together uh, and we, we chatted about that and we ran into each other a few times after that, but it has been many years since we, uh, since we didn't. So uh, that's my memory. Uh, let's see if Stephanie remembers it the same way. <laughs> I do actually, although yours yours is more precise because you remembered the Montreal Review of Books, which I had forgotten that was maybe the, the catalyst. Um, I do remember that it was relatively soon after I had moved to Montreal and started teaching at Concordia and that you had contacted me. And I remember that lovely occasion of going out for coffee and uh, and running into you at readings. And I think it's, it's uh, then, I don't know, my work started eating up my life. I moved to Point Claire. I had kids, you know, a, a lot to, fewer opportunities to, to go out to readings um, and to keep some of these connections going with, with local writers. So it was when I when I got the invitation to this and saw that we would be reading together, I was just so pleased because it's a, it's renewing, a, you know, a longstanding connection that I have always felt as well because, you know, I continue to receive the poems that you send out and I really, you know, read them and admire them. And, and I think it can sometimes be hard when we put things out into the world to know that people are paying attention. It, it, or to me anyway, with my work, it never feels like anybody's paying attention. It's just, you know, I, you, you write something and that's that's the reward and then you put it out there and maybe people find it, maybe they don't. But I, I definitely do appreciate your poems and I'm really pleased to have had the chance to, uh, to speak with you and read with you today. Um, I, but there's one more question here before we wrap things up. Uh, this is from Patrick Coleman. Uh, it's a question for Stephanie. He said, what did you discover in seeing your poems translated into French? And did you work with Daniel Canty on, on that translation? I did. He was, he was wonderful. I think it was the first book of poems that he translated. And when he approached me about that, I was just really honored that someone would... Uh, because it's, it's enormous amount of work, you know, to translate uh, a book and it, it took him a long time and we were quite closely in contact over that. I mean, my French is not as um, sophisticated as I would like it to be. So I could get a feeling of whether something felt loosely right, but I, I couldn't necessarily be very precise about it. Um, I learned that uh, I'm a big fan of ambiguity and I don't like to have to pin things down. Um, so sometimes, you know, for example, with French being a gendered language, he, he would say, well, did you mean, you know, does this pronoun refer to this thing or that thing or both? And almost always the answer was both. <laughs> and so I would sometimes have to choose. Um, there's also, it was, it was my first book, uh, which is, you know, poems inspired by Alice in Wonderland. And so there are a lot of puns. Um, and so he, again, it's, you know, pretty much impossible to, to translate the pun, um, but he would look to uh, try to create the sim a similar effect nearby in the poem. And so that was very interesting to see the things that he came up with. Um, and I also felt very detached from those poems by the time he was translating them. I've forgotten the timeline, but in my mind, they were kind of ancient history. Um, so I was really 
I was honored that he was working on them, but my impulse when there was something that uh, he asked me about was usually, oh, I don't actually like that line very much. I would really like to change it. Um, so I had to just respect the poems as they were written and let him translate those poems, even if I might have had the impulse to to rewrite them entirely. So I can see it I, It kind of touches on what you were saying earlier about uh, you have not wanting to translate your own poems. Um, I think if I had the skill to do that, I wouldn't want to do that either. I think it, it inevitably becomes a different poem. Um, and so let it be, let it be a different poem. Um, that, that would be from my own experience, but, but to have other people translate work is, is such an honor. So it was really, yeah, it was a really fascinating process to, to participate in and to kind of witness. Thanks for that question. Uh, and there's one more comment here. I just wanted to read, uh, this is from Rachel or Rachel. She says, thanks so much to both of you uh, uh, for a very rich and dark evening. She says with that little smile after it. Well, we, we can't help the short days in winter. It's not in our hands. <laughs> I guess it's conducive to writing deep and dark poetry. It's um, more... We're going to, we're going to um, wrap things up here. And I, I would like to thank Stephanie Bolster and Ihab Latayev. And thanks to our viewers for joining us. And I hope you uh, had a good afternoon with us. If you would like to watch uh, or listen to this event again, or you want to send it to a friend, or if you want to check out any of the other events in the series, and there are lots of them, you can go to the Saint des Arts de Stansted YouTube channel. Um, and I put the link for that somewhere in the chat section. I hope you can see it. Or you can look on the Facebook page of the Saint des Arts de Stansted, where we also post the readings. Um, before we wind up here, I'd like to thank the team at the center, Charles Gupta, Luce Couture, Diane Rijambal, and Gabriel Safdi, who's going to say a few words now to close the event. Gabriel. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, the, this light and dark and uh, so on, I just want to say that I think they really, they, I think of it in terms of minor key and major key in music. I think it's more like that. And if you think of, I think that gives you the sense more. It's not a question of so much light and so much dark. You know, it's just a question of the tonality of, of, of the feelings and so on and the vision. But anyhow, I want to thank you so much on behalf of uh, Santa's I understand said um, the participants and of course our, our wonderful poets Stephanie and Nihab for your wonderful readings. Uh, you know the um, you know Stephanie the probing into the self and into and, and the texture and, and the evo evocation of the texture of life in relation to art and nature and, and, and I think that is very rich and and that's and 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 uh, anyhow your voice speaks out for so many it's uh, and it's it, it really kind of takes us from the personal and the very personal to the universal and this, at the same time very cutting into social issues i think it's very rich very rich event today and thank you both so much for this wonderful uh, event and i want to continue to say one more thing about i want to remind you that sant as i understand said is in the process of building itself up to uh, to a very uh, a significant a center for the townships not just, and beyond. And uh, we are working toward getting our theater, which will be on the, on the site of the old cinema, the, the Haskell Cinema House that was built in 1912. And uh, it was the Haskell family who built the cinema house. And, and that is a very important uh, uh, contribution. It will be a very important contribution to the whole region and to the world of art and performing arts. And we will have events and we will have readings and, and anything from TED Talks and poetry readings and so on and so forth, play readings, but also a lot of performing arts events. So, but right now we're building up the team uh, and the, the, um, the, the fundraising uh, process is beginning. We're gonna have to get all the, all the support we can get from individuals, from, uh, from uh, companies, from, from the corporate and from the governments, yeah. So we're now in that in that in that process, and uh, thank you so much again. And next day, of course, the eleventh is it will be the last day for two, both the last events of our of our uh, arts. Right, thank you, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Gabriel. The last event will be uh, Yannick Rieu, who is a well-known jazz musician at you know, Carnegie Hall and so on. He's going to be it's going to be a very good event in Stansted, actually, BB, and it's going to be it's going to be uh, at five o'clock on that day. And the same day, the 11th, four to five, 
So I'm going to have to run from one to the other. But 45, we have we have uh, two two really fine poets. It's going to be a, a bilingual uh, event, and uh, we're going to have Carmine Stardino and uh, Francis uh, Catalano. That is be very interesting, really very interesting, as well as today, as as much as today. And I look forward to seeing all of you there again, and more. Take care. All the best. Have a good have a good week. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now you can open.